Probably the main point to make about pathogen evolution is that pathogens have their own agenda and they respond rapidly to things that they encounter. They do so because they have short generation times, vast numbers, and fairly high mutation rates. Many of them also have horizontal gene transfer. That makes them extraordinarily evolutionary flex evolutionarily flexible. Let's take a look at how that flexibility affects their virulence. The central idea in the evolutionary theory of virulence evolution is that there is a trade-off between virulence and transmission. And we'll go into the founding example of that and explore its consequences. Other things that affect the virulence of pathogens are whether they are transmitted vertically, horizontally, or by vectors, whether they infect their host singly or in the presence of other pathogens that are also infecting the host, single versus multiple infection. We will look at what serial transfer does. This is an evolutionary technology used to produce live vaccines and it actually uh, relies upon some basic insights from evolutionary ecology. And then finally, we'll take a look at the impact of extrinsic risk on the evolution of virulence. By extrinsic risk, that means what would happen to the virulence of the pathogen if the host was exposed to death from some other source, war, predators, something like that. Virulence can also evolve elsewhere, and when it evolves elsewhere, then the effect in the host is a byproduct, and there isn't really a co-evolutionary interaction with the host. Let's begin with the virulence transmission trade-off. The paradigm for this is myxoma virus infecting rabbits. Myxoma is transmitted by mosquitoes, fleas, lice, ticks, and mites. It causes tumors, but it doesn't kill immediately in cottontail rabbits in North and South America. But in European rabbits, it causes a disease called myxomatosis that has an initial 100% mortality rate. In 1950, it was introduced to Australia to control a devastating outbreak of rabbits. Rabbits had escaped from captivity. There are no native predators of rabbits in Australia. And they had uh, reproduced explosively and were eating the continent right down to the dust. What happened is that both the pathogen and the host then evolved. There was less virulence in the pathogen and there was better, vir better resistance in the host. You can see a, a recent paper to look into the genetics of pathogen virulence. This is a description of that outbreak. So here's a picture of a rabbit with myxoma virus. Here is a characterization of uh, different strains of the virus. On the x-axis, we have parasite-induced host mortality per day, and this is the host recovery rate over here, naturally a negative relationship. Strain one is very virulent, and strain five is low virulence, but you'll see that strain three, which has intermediate virulence, is still fairly nasty. The history in Australia and, and Britain is in this panel over here. So when it was introduced in 1951, it was all strain one, so it was very virulent. What then happened is a very rapid shift towards dominance by strain three. Okay, and that is where there's about 0.05% or 0.5% host mortality, 0.05 risk of mortality per day. That means about 20 days survival. So rabbits live for about three weeks. That's, they die pretty quickly. And the important thing is that that doesn't change and it doesn't get better. Okay, so the virulence evolves to an intermediate point and then it stops there. And at that point, it is still deadly. So how does it work? Well, if the rabbit dies quickly, there's very little opportunity for fleas and other insects to transmit the disease. So if the rabbit is dying quickly, then a less virulent form that doesn't kill the host as rapidly will outcompete the more virulent form because they have superior transmission. So the important thing going on here is to realize that the pathogens are competing with other pathogens both within the host and then in how effectively they infect between hosts. 
and both in-host performance and transmission are important. So the less virulent forms are doing worse in a single host, but they're doing better out there in the population as a whole. That's how you get from type 1 down to type 3. At the same time, the hosts are evolving genetic resistance and adaptive immunity. This example has been repeated. Uh, this is an experimental system where beetles are being infected by microsporidians. It was found that genetic resistance increased in the host and pathogen virulence decreased to an intermediate level. This is survival of the host here, and this is the log of the number of spores being produced by the pathogen. So host survival is intermediate, and it is a function of how virulent the pathogen is. The control lines are up here. The co-evolved lines are down here. And this line here shows the result of coevolution. So basically what goes on is that host survival improves a bit and then stabilizes, and the number of spores produced goes down a bit. So that was a fairly short-term response. So the take-home message on the virulence transmission trade-off is that it often exists, and from the pathogen's point of view, it's really a major problem if the pathogen is only living in this host. If the pathogen doesn't solve this problem, then it's going to go locally extinct if it is specific to this host. Now, the next thing that affects virulence evolution is mode of transmission. What do we mean by that? Well, vertical transmission is between parent and offspring. So it's going, what we are thinking of reproduction as being vertical. And that is a direct way of getting the parasite from one host into the other. It will select for low virulence, and eventually it will select for commensalism. There, because the genetic interests of the host and the pathogen are completely identical in this case, uh, there is no reason for the pathogen to do anything to disturb the reproduction and survival of the host. Strictly horizontal direct transmission selects for high virulence. Now, the thing that would break that would simply be the virulence transmission trade-off. And if there is a vector involved, a mosquito, a, uh, a tick, or something like that, then the impact of the vector's presence depends on what the efficiency of the vector does to transmit that given different virulences of the disease. And in fact, in this case, the disease is evolving both with the vector and with the, with the host that we're focused on, the patient. A good example of a directly transmitted horizontal uh, pathogen would be any of these, okay? So these are all transmitted by water. And this is why clean water provided by modern sewage systems had a, such a huge impact on human survival. Just pick up a couple of these cases in this slide. Typhoid fever, 22 million cases annually, 200,000 deaths, still. Rotavirus, which causes infant diarrhea, 2 million infants hospitalized every year, half a million of them die. Dysentery, 165 million cases every year, 600,000 of them die. That's what happens when people go to the bathroom in the same water supply that they later drink. The next thing affecting virulence evolution is whether or not the infection is single or multiple. If you look at it from the pathogen's point of view, basically what we're saying is, am I in here by myself or am I in here with some competition? Multiple infection, that is being in there with the competition, selects for increased virulence if the impact of the parasites on the host is through mortality. What's going on there is that the strains, the different pathogens, are competing to be represented in transmission, and that is changing the virulence transmission trade-off in the following way. To be transmitted, the pathogen has to dominate the competition, 
But in doing so, in order to dominate the competition and make itself more frequent, it has to damage the host more. And therefore, virulence increases and the host dies sooner. However, there is another way that this kind of interaction can be mediated, and that is through sublethal effects on growth or anything else that is sublethal effect on the host. And if those sublethal effects feed back onto the parasites to reduce their rate of development so that a more slowly growing host is less able to support rapidly growing parasites, so the parasites grow more slowly because the host is growing slowly, then a multiple infection will generally lead to lower virulence. So you can't just uh, say and remember multiple infection, higher virulence. It all depends upon whether the impact is on mortality or on some sublethal effect like growth. One of the most medically interesting evolutionary considerations about the evolution of virulence has to do with how many hosts are being used and what happens in a new host. The motto behind this is that a jack of all trades is the master of none. A pathogen that does very well in one host will do poorly in another because they adapt locally to that host. The more host species that are regularly infected, the less well adapted the pathogen is to any one of them. And a pathogen that evolves to be really good at exploiting one host will lose efficiency on others. It turns out this is how attenuated live viruses are used, are produced. Okay, how, are that, how is that done? How do you produce an attenuated live virus uh, vaccine? An attenuated live vaccine, such as, say, the yellow fever vaccine or the Sabine oral polio vaccine, is produced by serial passage. Microbiologists have used serial passage for a long time to study pathogen virulence. And it works because pathogens evolve really quickly. The fact that it works demonstrates that there really are widespread trade-offs in performance on different hosts. Those trade-offs limit host ranges, that is how many different kinds of things can this pathogen infect, and they also constrain the emergence of new diseases because they make it hard for a disease that specializes, say, on an animal reservoir to jump into a human population. So let's go back to vaccine production. Basically, the way that you do this is you take the pathogen out of some other host, out of a human, perhaps, and you infect a mouse or a rabbit with it. And you let the parasite grow. And before the parasite starts to get limited in that mouse or rabbit, you take it out. And you put it into a new mouse or rabbit, and you let it grow. From the parasite's point of view, it is growing exponentially all the time. And it's usually being done on a genetically homogeneous host. This is done with inbred mice or rabbits, which makes it really easy for the parasite to specialize on that host. And it all, in, in, in specializing on that host, it is losing its ability to infect and exploit its original host, probably a human. So here's an example of uh, the number of passages in mice for Salmonella typhimurium and the percentage of mice that are dead. So this is in the new host, okay? Virulence increases. At the beginning, there's very little virulence. Very few mice die. After 10 passages, 90% of the mice are being killed. It's getting very good at exploiting that mouse host. What happens in the former host? Here is the poliomyelitis virus. It's being passaged in cell culture, okay? And this is the percentage of monkeys that it's killing. So the monkeys are being used to test how virulent it is. That it is. They're being used as a proxy for humans. And you can see that the more passages you have through cell culture, the fewer monkeys die. It's getting really good at reproducing on cell culture and very bad at killing monkeys. These data are, in fact, from the original paper by Sabine. And it was at this point that it was decided that the virus was safe as a, an oral vaccine. Okay.
Another factor, which is at this point a bit more theoretical, is that the level of extrinsic risk that the host faces, so things that are not the pathogen that might kill it, will affect the virulence evolution of the pathogen. The idea here is that if the host is going to die anyway for some other reason, there is less reason for the pathogen to limit its impact. That means that virulence should increase in pathogens infecting hosts whose lifespan is reduced for reasons that have nothing to do with the virulence of the pathogens. Or, in other words, disease should be a more serious problem in species and populations that are getting hammered for other reasons anyway. Well, there are lots of species and populations that get hammered for other reasons, and many of them seem to have solved this problem because they don't necessarily seem to be more susceptible to disease than populations that aren't. However, there haven't been any controlled experiments done to test this idea directly, and the effect may very well be real. Now, finally, there's a lot of virulence evolution that goes on in other contexts. Here is an ecological classification of pathogens. So we have some specialists on humans and some non-specialists on humans, and we have some obligate parasites. So that would be, say, Plasmodium falciparum, malaria, HIV in humans, influenza virus, and TB, mycobacterium tuberculosis. Those are all things that have to complete their life cycle in humans. Then there's some generalists. So these are opportunists, such as Borrelia burgdorferi, that's Lyme disease, or rabies virus, or Salmonella, or Bartonella. Those are all things that are not specialists on humans. Again, we have some facultative parasites that can be on humans or not, but some specialize on humans. We have some commensal opportunists. Those are things like Staph aureus, for example, that live in our bodies all the time, but then only break out when they move between tissues within our bodies. And then there are non-specialists. There are environmental opportunists, such as Pseudomonas aeruginosa, or Burkholderia, or Mycobacterium marinum, or Vibrio. Fulnificus. Those are things out there in the, in, in the environment. The important point about where you are, basically, is that if you're not in the human the whole time, the human may not be that important to your own life cycle and may not be shaping the evolution of your virulence. We know that responses to sources are stronger than responses to sinks. If the source is another animal population, then the pathogen will, will be responding very strongly to that and not very much to humans, especially if in humans it always goes extinct, as do Ebola and rabies. They won't evolve in humans. And the significance of effects depends on the frequency of encounter. So it's quite natural to think that the more time something happens, the bigger the response to it will be. And if most of the experiences that pathogens are having their frequency of interaction is with some other species and not with humans, then their virulence evolution in humans is going to be trivial and it will be mostly a byproduct of stuff happening elsewhere. So to summarize, if we intervene, we can trigger the evolution of greater virulence. Anything we do that shifts transmission from vertical towards horizontal will increase virulence. Anything that increases the frequency of multiple infections with more impact on mortality than growth will increase virulence. Anything that reduces host lifespan for some non-pathogen reason will probably increase virulence. And anything that selects for survival of more virulent strains within the host will increase virulence. So those are all things that we do that will cause pathogens to react to what we're up to.